darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within. guest today, if this is your first time being here, we hope you feel welcome and that you know that uh, uh, this is a safe place, a place full of grace. Um, summer's here, and there's some things that I really enjoy doing in the summer. Uh, one of them is going for walks, and Eric and I on Canada Day wandered down and saw this great sign, 60th anniversary for uh, the Sea Leagues. Congratulations. And uh, we actually, uh, we dropped by, but, but Carl and Frida weren't at home, but Carl has put a great sign in the yard, and I don't, don't know if it's still there, but congratulations. Um, one other thing we really enjoy doing in the summer, as well as camping and getting out on the water, is just looking up at the stars, being out there in a, on a nice summer evening, sitting out and just staring up into the heavens. And I imagine some of you have done that before. Maybe you've got great memories of you know, being there as a family or with your kids or just you know, with someone special, just staring up at the stars, asking the questions like, are we alone? What else is out there? You know, why, what was God doing when he put together this, this world the way we see it? Just if we go to the next uh, slide, um, I think, thanks so much. Um, 
you know, campfires, being outside with friends and enjoying the beauty of a summer evening is something that a lot of us are looking forward to. And uh, hopefully not quite as hot as it was during our heat wave <laughs> last week, but still, um, you know, summer is here and there are lots to look forward to. Just if we go ahead to the next slide, thanks. Yeah. So the question, what is out there? Many people uh, have um, thought a lot about that question. Maybe the better word would be obsessed with that question. There's a lot of people who just, uh, it, it, it just kind of captures their imagination, that question, the what if, what is out there in space? And for people who are like that, they were looking forward to the end of June, really looking forward to the end of June, because the U.S. finally did it. Did you hear about this? This top secret file, this top secret report from the U.S. military, that they have been tracking uh, what they would call unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP. Uh, we used to just refer to it as UFOs. <laughs> Uh, unidentified flying objects, but they, they, they now use the acronym UAP. And the U.S. military have had fighter pilots that, you know, even over the last 20 years, have encountered 144 unexplained objects in the sky. Not only is it the eyewitnesses of the U.S. fighter pilots, but the, through their radar and their technology, they've recorded them. And so uh, here's some examples of some of these pictures that were released earlier this year as we were looking for this report to come out, the UAP report. If you just go to the next slide, you get a close-up on this weird object that doesn't really move through space the way that you would think uh, a plane or something should move through space. Now, there was 144 of those, and only one has been explained. And the one, the hundred, uh, the one of the 144, uh, the U.S. military said we are sure that that was a, a balloon, a weather balloon that was deflating and doing something weird in the sky. But 140, 143, they still have no idea. Is it technology from another country? Is it something that someone has put into the sky as a hoax? Is it something from outside of our planet? We don't know. Nothing is off the table. And so that report came out at the end of, uh, end of June. You can actually go online and download the, the U.S. government's UAP report and read it, and it'll be extremely unsatisfying because <laughs> it has all questions, no answers. Just that there's something that is appearing in the skies that could pose danger for their fighter jets. But of course, there will be a, a group, there will be a community that will just jump all over this report. And you don't have to go to Area 51 in Nevada, as you see here to look for uh, people who are waiting for UFOs to appear. Uh, you can go to places like right here in Nova Scotia, Shag Harbor. Anyone been to the UFO Center in Shag Harbor? All right, okay, it's, it's closer to home than you think. You know, people who see things they just can't explain. Could there be life, intelligent life, outside of this planet? Eric and I grew up as kids of the 70s and 80s, and so we grew up with Star Wars and E.T., the extraterrestrial, which I think is probably one of Eric's favorite childhood movies. Uh, and, you know, this expectation that, you know, there could be anything out there. We just don't know. What if there is life beyond this planet? Um, that kind of science fiction that Eric and I and our generation have really enjoyed isn't just a modern phenomenon. In fact, there have been stories like that that go back far, far into history. One of the earliest examples we have is just 100 years after Jesus, uh, Lucian of uh, Samosata. Samosata, or Syria, he's a Syrian Greek author, uh, wrote about these Greeks that were able to make a ship that could go into the sky and out to the moon and beyond. And uh, interesting, uh, I don't know if some of you have ever uh, read the book um, The Martian by uh, Andy Weir. Any, anyone else? Oh, oh, okay, Summer Read. You have to get Andy Weir's The Martian. Or, or watch the Matt Damon movie based on it. It's really good, it's really good. Anyway, and, uh, uh, Andrew Weir, or Andy Weir, uh, put out an, a new book. It just came out this last month. I got it for my birthday. And uh, again, looking at, you know, could there be life outside of this planet? Uh, the new book is called um, Hail Mary. 
nothing to do with the Virgin Mary. <laughs> but Lucian of uh, Samosata wrote about going out and encountering these, these creatures from another planet that were like giant spiders. It's interesting that, that the story that goes back to that time, 100 years after Jesus, could have been written by a science fiction writer today. Could have been written by a science fiction writer today. That's not the only example. There's lots of examples through the Middle Ages. One of the, the, probably the, the best examples is from the stories of the Arabian Nights around the 8th century, where the, uh, the author of one particular story wrote about a mechanical horse made out of this brass. And uh, it almost kind of sounds like something that would be like, you know, cyberpunk. You know, this, like, the, those Victorian 19th century ideas of, you know, putting together weird science to do crazy, almost magical things. But in Arabian Nights, they put together this mechanical horse that can fly them, because it's a mechanical horse, of course it can fly, and <laughs> leaves the planet Earth and goes out past the moon, out towards the sun, so they can explore all of this the space that is around us. Now, stories like this have been shared and have been dreamt about by people for a very long time as we look up into the heavens and think, what's out there? Could there be more? Now, some of the people who really want to try to find UFOs or aliens in the Bible will look to the Old Testament to the visions of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel, as we've talked about here before, had some pretty wild visions. Uh, for example, Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4, uh, talks about this contraption in the sky. It'll be talked about as a wheel within a wheel, and these beings in it that have long legs and wings and just look like totally different from anything you've ever imagined or seen before. Now, I don't think Ezekiel is talking about aliens here. <laughs> I think the, his uh, apocalyptic visions in the book of Ezekiel don't refer to life outside of the planet. They talk about spiritual realities. So I don't think you're going to find any examples of aliens like that in the Bible. So don't be disappointed if that's your bent. Is this all just science fiction is my question. Is this all just science fiction? Should we even entertain people who want to talk about life outside the planet? Is this all just fiction? Because we're surrounded by lots of fiction, especially as the summer movies start playing on Netflix or in the, the theaters that will look to space and look to the potential of life outside of us is a great adventure, a great diversion. Often there, unfortunately, the aliens are very, uh, in, in science fiction movies, very antagonistic and seen as a threat. But I think there's something here that's worth scratching, getting under the surface, because I think there's some truth here that's worth us thinking about this morning. Could there be life? What's out there? Is there anything else in the universe, or are we alone? The Bible tells us, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> that God created all of the universe. Everything that is and that has ever existed is created by God. And God gives Adam and Eve this great um, instruction to go out and to name things, which we've talked about before as really being the roots of science to go out and to understand and to give names to all the life that God has created. Um, I, we've also talked about the, the, the magnitude of the universe and the heavenly bodies that, that the stars that are referred to in the Bible, we would not realize that there's more than just stars, more than just balls of gas and light out in, 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 the, in the space that is beyond our planet. There's so much more out there. In fact, if you were to take a drinking straw and look up at the darkest part of the night sky, uh, you would be surprised on what you might find. If you've got a big telescope like Hubble, which has done this, they've taken this um, huge telescope and have looked at a piece of the night sky about the size of what you'd see through a drinking straw, and they found this deep space uh, evidence that there's a lot more to the universe than we once knew. We showed this picture before. In that darkest part of the night sky, if you were to take just a drinking straw circle out of that sky, this is what you would see if you stare a big, if you pick a big telescope like Hubble or Kepler and focus it out into that night sky and, and leave it on. And these aren't just stars, these are galaxies. In fact, Hubble has, as many of you know, has been taking more and more pictures going deep into that deep space to get images of what is out there. Psalm 40, 147 tells us, 
God determines the numbers of the stars, and he calls each one by name. God is not surprised by anything that we will find in space. That anything the Hubble telescope sees, it's not a surprise to God. He already knows it. He already knows it's there. He already has a name for it. Now, we don't have the names. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't give us the list of all the names of things that God has created, so we get the joy of naming them. And so scientists uh, associated with uh, Hubble have called this the Sombrero Galaxy because, you know, it looks like a hat. <laughs> I wonder what God's name for this galaxy is. I have no idea. But the Sombrero Galaxy has billions of stars in it, billions of stars. The Hubble telescope has taken lots of wonderful pictures of things that, you know, I, I can't imagine what God might have called them. Here's, I, I, I like to call this one the, the butterfly, but I don't know what God calls it. Or here we have another galaxy. It's just incredible. These, this is part of what God designed when he created the universe. This next one is called the twinkling field. And I, again, I don't know what God calls it, but it's just spectacular that the universe is filled with stars and nebula and black holes and planets. That as we go through, and we can just flip through a few more of these pictures as I'm talking, that we are discovering more and more about the universe that God created. And one of the things we are discovering is that the universe is also filled with planets like this. This is an exoplanet. In, in, in the year 2000, scientists on the Earth could identify 50 exoplanets. So these are planets that go around stars, not our sun, but other stars and other solar systems or you know, other parts of this galaxy, the Milky Way, where we live. So in the year 2000, there were 50. In the year 2013, they knew 450. And today, as of July 1st, 2021, it's almost 5,000. 4,777 exoplanets have been identified and named have, with certainty by scientists. It, it, it is basically, the number is doubling every two years. That the more that scientists look into space, the more planets we are finding, and it's doubling every two years. And so just the fact that there are so many planets that God has made, just the fact that God loves life, we can ask the question, as a person of faith, what if we are not alone in the universe? What if, in God, when God made the universe, that life was created in places other than Earth? What if? Billy Graham, who some of you may recognize, he was an evangelist and a Baptist preacher. Billy Graham talked a lot about life outside of this life. In fact, he said, I firmly believe there are intelligent beings like us far away in space who worship God. But we have nothing to fear from these people. Like us, they are God's creation. Now, that might surprise you that a preacher, someone so well-known as Billy Graham, would even take time to think about that. But a lot of people do. Looking up at the night sky, what if we're not alone? What if there is more life in the universe than we know? And you don't have to be looking for UFOs or, or, or little green men to take seriously the potential that God may have, in God's own freedom, decided to create more life than what we know about. The Bible isn't silent when it comes to extraterrestrial life. We're going to look at a, a particular few verses later on. But some people say, well, the Bible never talks about aliens. And and I will admit, there is no particular passage you could point to as a proof verse and say, look, this is where the aliens are. <laughs> the Bible never actually does that. But there are things that I think can lead us to ask the question. First of all, though, because there isn't a proof text, I do want to say that there's a lot of things that are very real, that are very much a part of all of our lives, that you don't actually find in the Bible. Like, for example, the Bible never talks about coffee. <laughs> That's such an important part of my life. It's not in the Bible other than the fact that he brews, which I know is a terrible joke. There are Hebrews in the Bible. Thank you, thank you. That was very kind of you laughing. <laughs> so the Bible doesn't talk about coffee. It doesn't talk about cell phones or bicycles or indoor plumbing or breakfast cereal or corn or dental hygiene or prenatal care or marsupials or vaccines. None of these things are discussed in the Bible. And yet, they're things that we all know about. 
And of course, you could, you could make a much longer list. You could go on all day just listing things that aren't discussed in the Bible. It doesn't mean they're not real. It just means that they weren't important or they didn't exist in the world of those biblical authors when God moved his spirit in their lives and they wrote on the pages of the scriptures that we now know is God's authority in our lives. The, bar, the Bible is far from silent on the question of creation of the universe. The Bible talks a lot about the creation of the universe and the fact that all life that exists ultimately is here because of Jesus, because of the Christ. Jesus was born about 2,000 years ago. That's when Jesus, the man, the God-man, God with us, Emmanuel, came into the world. But we refer to Jesus Christ, Christ not being his last name, but a title. We've talked about this before, Christ meaning the anointed one or the Messiah. That Christ existed before Christmas. <laughs> that the second person of the Trinity, God, God the Son, the Christ, the, as, Paul, or sorry, as John will refer to him as the Logos, the Word of God. As Jesus refers to himself, the light of the world, he existed from the very beginning. And in John's Gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has ever been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We exist because of Jesus Christ. We were created by him. For we read in Colossians, as Paul says, Christ existed before anything else, and he holds all things together. As Paula read this morning, everything in the universe is held together. It's order in the midst of chaos because of what Jesus has done. God has created all there is, and Jesus is, it was through Jesus that creation happened, and it's in Jesus that creation is held together and that we experience life. Genesis 1, as many of you are very familiar, begins, God says, let there be light, and there was, and God saw it was good. Did you ever think of that verse before in Genesis 1? Genesis 1, verse 3, God says, let there be light. What's he referring to here? Many of us just assume he's referring to the sun or the moon, but the Genesis account says that the sun and the moon are created on day four. Day four is in Genesis chapter 16 to 19. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern day and night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. So what was that light on day one? If it wasn't the sun and if it wasn't the moon, what was that light that was in the beginning? I believe that light was God's light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. God begins with light. And we know that light is actually, it is the most basic thing in all of the universe. Albert Einstein said that light, Albert Einstein said that light is the only constant in the universe. The speed of light never changes, and it is the only thing that is changeless that we as humans can observe physically in the universe, light. Not only is light constant, but light is everywhere. We are surrounded by light. Um, every atom of our bodies, you know, if you were to look at your hands, the carbon that's inside your hands, Astrophysicists will tell you that the only way that carbon could be made was in the center of a star. That we, as you've probably heard many times before, are stardust. When God created light, that light is what formed much of the atoms that make up our very bodies. That all that we know and exist, when God made it, it was in that light. And then it eventually would be used to form planets and stars and it would be from the dust of the earth that God would form man and woman as just as God would form, form the life in the sea and the birds in the air and the creatures on the earth. What is light? I bet there's some uh, science teachers listening or some of you who are maybe have had some scientific background. Can anyone tell me what is light? Okay. 
It's an absence of darkness, okay? Good, good, well done. Well done, Wally. Light is an absence of darkness. Light, light is electromagnetic waves. Did you know that? Light is energy. In fact, just if we go to this slide here, you can see a wavelength. So light is electromagnetic waves. And, and our eyes, the way God has made them, we can see just a piece a small piece of that spectrum of light. If you see it here in the slide above me, just that little sliver, it's between 700 and 400 nanometers. When the wavelengths are in that little gap, our eyes can pick up and see it. But light is this electromagnetic wave that's going on all around us. And some of those waves have long wavelengths. And we know they exist because Half of you or more are listening over that right now, it's called radio. The long wavelengths of light are what we refer to as radio waves. Some of you in your homes have machines that will create other waves of light that are longer than, than the light we see, but shorter than radio waves, and they're called microwaves. That's right. Some of you know of light uh, that is shorter than the light that we see, and we put on sun lotion to protect ourselves from it. It's UV light, yeah, ultraviolet, ultraviolet light. Richard Moore, who's a part of our church for years, operated large machines that shot tight um, uh, wavelengths of light through people's bodies so he could see through and look at their bones. It's called X-ray light, excellent. And of course, when, when, when people go to space, I know that right now is NASA and different space organizations are looking at someday sending people to Mars, they're very worried about this other kind of light called gamma that is so tight that it's radioactive and it can cause cancer. Light is all around us and we only see a small part of it. The universe is literally filled with light. In fact, if you were to to go out on a hot day, like we had this last week when that, we had the little heat wave, and you were to, to put your hand up in the sky, and, and don't look directly at the sunlight because you won't be able to see, but you put your hand up into the sky and you can feel that heat of the sun beating down on you. In that moment, within a second that your hand is facing the sun, a billion neutrinos will pass through your hand and through the planet and go out the other side. Neutrinos, the smallest particle that we know of now in the universe, is coming out from the sun and it's shooting right through us and it doesn't harm us because it is so tiny and it is so small, it passes right through us and doesn't harm us on the way through. Scientists have found really clever ways to measure neutrinos. And believe it or not, they use giant weather balloons on the Antarctic and Arctic. <laughs> Maybe that's what they're seeing in those planes. Light. It is all around us. Many of us think of space as dark and cold and black. But think of it this way. In fact, uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this in his great science fiction novels, that if you were on a bright, sunny day on the beach and you know, it's a clear sky and the sun is beating on you, how warm that feels. That sun is just beating down. Imagine once you get off the planet and you don't have the protection of the atmosphere around you, that sun is directly on you now. And you can turn away and you have the darkness and the cold, but on your back, that sun is hitting you. That wasn't a very attractive picture of myself. I'll turn around this way. <laughs> the sun is just beaming down on you. And space is filled with light. Space is filled. In fact, uh, even though we think of space as empty, it is filled with the tiniest particles of light that are shooting through it. It is filled with tiny particles of hydrogen that are just coming off the sun constantly. Now, we have an electromagnetic field around our planet that protects us from that. But space is filled with light. God said, let there be light, and it was good. For from light, God has made all things. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. We read again, remember in John, that in him was life, and that life was the light of all humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. When Jesus refers to himself as the light of the world, of course, the deeper meaning is that he is spiritual light, that we live in a world of spiritual darkness. What is our purpose? Why are we here? 
Does my life matter? Am I valued? All of that, we find answers in the light of Christ, who reveals to us God's purposes and God's love and human dignity and value that each one of us have been made as image, in the image of God. Each one of us are beloved children of the God who made us and wants to, us to experience relationship with God and with one another. Humanity is unique and special in the story of creation, for we alone have been made in the image of God. But we have to remember that we weren't the first thing that God created. It was on day three that God made plant life. It was on day four that God made fish and made birds. Sorry, that's wrong. It was on day five that God made fish and made birds. Day six, God makes all of the creatures. And then at the very end of day six, God makes humanity. Now, we don't know how long the days of creation really were, whether it was, well, I, I, obviously from the fossil record, there was a period of time between each of those things that God made. And if we look and take seriously the fossil record, and you can, just, you can go along the Bay of Fundy or the shores of Nova Scotia, and you can find fossils that date back millions of years. And we see that this planet was filled with reptiles for a very long time. And even during that time, God said it was good. Which tells me that God likes lizards. <laughs> if you've got a grandkid or someone who wants a lizard, Erica really wants a bearded dragon, you know, you're not alone, because God likes lizards too. God, God just loved this planet and loved the life on it when it was just filled with lizards. And he loves us that much more. Francis Collins is uh, the director for the National Institute of Health in the US. And some of you may recognize his name because he was the director, the person who led the Human Genome Project that mapped the, the the, the human DNA that mapped our understanding of, of the code that makes us human. Uh, he is a, a world-renowned and respected scientist and a devout follower of Jesus. In fact, he has this wonderful program now called BioLogos, which gathers Christian scientists and uh, just professionals in the field and across all of the sciences together to talk about faith and to talk about science and what we're learning in the world. It's a wonderful resource, and you can certainly find it online, or if you listen to podcasts, they have a podcast as well. Francis Collins said, I think that God appreciates when we appreciate his creation. I think God, it makes God smile, it makes God, God, God happy. It makes God happy when we notice the incredible detail of what God has done when we see the grandeur, and when we worship him and saying, God, you did this. From that hummingbird in my feeder to the stars in the night sky, it is all from you and your imagination, God. That's a part of our worship. Bill Clinton, who is the president of the United States during the time when Francis Collins was revealing the Human Genome Project, when they finally finished mapping what many people thought was an impossibility, the, the millions of, of data points that make up the human genome. Bill Clinton said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. And we are gaining ever more awe for the complexity, the beauty, the wonder of God's most divine and sacred gift. The more we learn about space and about our own bodies, the more it points us to our creator. The book of Acts, when, when uh, Paul is preaching there in the Agropola in Athens, he says to those people there as he preaches this great sermon, Acts 17, Christ is the light of the world. And Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. God loves us. And we see this in God's creativity. And we see it in the diversity of what God is doing in this world and beyond this world. And it shouldn't hurt our feelings to think that before God created us, he called the earth good. And it shouldn't surprise us if someday we discover that God has created life outside of this planet. In fact, like Billy Graham, I expect it. Maybe not in my lifetime, maybe not even in my grandkids' lifetime, but someday, even in the new creation, I think we will discover that God has been up to a lot more than we ever expected. God deals differently, of course, with humanity than he does his creatures. 
I think that's why some uh, uh, Christian theologians like C.S. Lewis and uh, um, Billy Graham have said that if there is life, it is worshiping God already. That the story of the fall is a human story. That we, as God's children, our story is caught up in the brokenness of our own experience of fall. And the story of the fall and the need for Jesus to come and to redeem us is a uniquely human story. God interacts with the animals and with the birds and the fish and all the life that God has created in a different way than us. And the Bible tells us this. In Psalm 148 that Erica read, in Psalm 150, we are told that let everything that has breath praise the Lord. All creation praises God. If you ever read the the book of Job, take a look at the last few chapters of Job. And there's incredible detail of God appreciating and loving the animal life that God has made. Job is filled with that. And then in the book of Revelation, we have this really odd phrase. And I want to share that with you really briefly today. We read in Revelation chapter 5, verse 13, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth and on the sea, all that is in them, singing praising Christ. This is Revelation 5, 13. The word every creature in heaven is the word zoon. And it's interesting that all through the Bible, the word zoon, kind of like the word zoo, is never used to refer to people or to angels. It is only ever used to refer to created creatures. The zoon of the sea and the zoon of the land and the zoon of the sky. And now in the book of Revelation, we have this odd reference to the zoon of the heavens. Does it mean that there is life on other planets? Maybe not, but maybe it does. <laughs> and whatever it is that God has created, it, we know it is good, and God intended it to be there. All creatures, all animals are a part of praising God. Except one. And if we just go to the next slide, Jesus is very clear that it breaks God's heart that there is one creature that is that has fallen away from God's purposes, and that's us, humanity. Jesus tells a story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and that one sheep gets lost. You know the story? And the good shepherd who is in the story, really Jesus, God, loves us and wants to rescue us because we've we've walked away, we've moved away from the life that God has created us to live in him. And so the good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep and goes off and finds the one lost sheep. That is the story of the Gospels. Jesus has come to save humanity. We are the lost sheep. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't love or loves any less the other 99. God loves us. And the story of Jesus, the good news of the Gospel, is that he comes to bring us back into unity with him. God does not love any less the rest of his creation. And you can say, ah, because that's a cute little sheep. (laughs) Ah. Thanks. Thank you. It's the next slide. Thanks. C.S. Lewis wrote one other thing, and as I was getting ready for today, when when I hit it, it really struck me. Lewis wrote, I look forward with horror the contact with the inhabitants of other planets if there are such, that we would only transport to them all of our sin and our equivalent, equi- equi- I'm going to skip that word, <laughs> and establish a new colonialism. I can't bear to think of it. It's the next slide. But if we on earth here get it right with God, of course all would be changed. Once we find ourselves spiritually awakened, that's in Christ, we can go to outer space and take good things with us. This is quite a different matter. I wonder if the reason that there isn't such huge space between planet Earth and all the other planets that God made is to protect them from us. <laughs> because believe it or not, the Bible does like to use the word alien. The word alien is all found, it's found throughout the scriptures. In fact, Paul read it this morning. But it always refers to us. We are the aliens. We are alienated from God. We are alienated from each other. When Eric and I uh, lived in Kenya, we were called aliens. 
uh, Eric and I and our family had alien cards. In fact, I still have my alien card, and it's still stamped in my passport. I have an alien registration in my passport. Because when I was in Kenya, I wasn't where I belonged. But I was a registered alien. I was a legal alien. But I was a little different. And the whole time that we were there, we received nothing but grace and hospitality and welcome from the people of Kenya. But we were aware that it wasn't our home we were visiting. What's sad is that, as Lewis mentions, For so much of our history, we who have found Christ have had the opportunity to show that kind of hospitality and welcome to outsiders, and we've continued to fail to do it. The story of colonialism, us encountering the other or the alien, has been rife with cruelty and misunderstanding, with greed and with pain. And over this last month, especially I think in Canada, we've become more and more aware of it. We've always known it. We've known our past, our story, of how we interact with people who are different than us, but we kind of brushed it aside or kept it under the table. But our story hasn't been a good story. And there's something for us, I think, to learn right now about how we deal with the other that's extremely important. Dr. Terry LeBlanc is a Nova Scotian. Uh, He's Acadian, Mi'kmaq and he is the leader of the uh, uh, Pathways, uh, uh, Indigenous Pathways group across North America. Uh, He's one of our own, and he's a great Christian scholar and pastor. Terry says there's a myth that we have labored under for centuries as Indigenous communities, and the myth is that we were godless, heathen people. And Terry and many other Christian leaders within the, the First Nations and Inuit and Métis community in Canada have recognized that God was here moving amongst them. They didn't yet know the name Jesus, but they knew of the one creator who loved them and made this whole universe and made this land and that they were created to, be, to have a relationship with him and that there was something about the way they related to that God, that spirit that impacted the way they were supposed to live with other people. Now, today, you might not know this, but two-thirds of the First Nations community in Canada are followers of Jesus. Two-thirds. And there are followers of Jesus, believers in our First Nations community, who have a lot to teach us. This is uh, Richard uh, Twist. Richard said, First Nation culture has an understanding that the Creator put us here not as owners, but as stewards, as hosts. The colonials didn't know how to come as guests. They came as colonizers, going into the world, not just to bring Jesus, but to bring civilization, or to bring their version of civilization. Jesus Christ meets people where they are, and he wants to transform us, to make us fully human, and not less than that. There is a lot that we can learn from those who are different from us. We can be good neighbors, and as we are good neighbors, we will discover that there's perspectives on Jesus, perspectives on the Bible, perspectives on God and creation that we can benefit from and that can enrich and change us if we are to enter into real mutual relationships with First Nations, with people from Africa, Latin America. We are part of a big family around this planet. As Canadians, we know that our past was an attempt to assimilate people who are different than us, to meet the alien and to make them like us. And in the midst of that story, we miss the opportunity to coexist and mutuality and respect and interdependence. And yet that is what we are called to be as followers of Jesus, good neighbors who love others, even our enemies, like we love ourselves. Many Canadian Baptists have been learning this, and uh, I'm um, just excited to know that as a part of that network of Baptists across Canada, we've been taking seriously our relationship with Indigenous communities for decades now. We have an Indigenous working group right here in Atlantic Canada that's done a lot of important work starting to build bridges, to build healing. In fact, some of you I know were a part of the Oasis gathering two summers ago where we had a blanket healing service. We had an opportunity to be together with people in our own First Nation communities here and across our Canadian Baptist family in Atlantic Canada 
to start a process of dialogue and healing that continues to this day. And if I was to encourage any of you who are beginning that path of understanding, because that's where it begins, is acknowledging that there's an issue and trying to build understanding. Dr. Danny Zacharias of Acadia Divinity College has put together a wonderful course. Uh, This course would normally cost someone $1,000 to be part of it, and you you can all take it for free on your own time, on your computer. It's all in videos. You can sit down. Eric and I have been doing that course. And, you know, to spend, you know, half an hour, an hour a day over the the 20 sessions um, is valuable. And it's a way for us to learn a story that many of us just have not really listened to before. And uh, you can find that online. Just all you have to do is Google walking in a good way with our indigenous neighbors. And the course is free to anyone who would like to take it. Finally, uh, this is... uh, um, Uh, Richard Rohr, a Catholic leader and priest, who wrote, perhaps the primary example of our lack of attention to Christ's mystery can be seen in the way we continue to pollute and ravage planet Earth. And he's talking about the environment, but he's also talking about relationships. The very thing we stand on and live from. Science now appears to love and to respect physicality more than religion does. When I read the words of Richard Rohr, I felt very convicting because I'm aware of how much the secular scientific community is trying to find ways to take care of this planet and all of the people who are on it. And how, many, how much we as the church fail to recognize that that is also our role. That is what we are called to do as followers of Jesus, to be good stewards of this planet and to take seriously the relationships of all people who are on it. If we just take this last picture, thanks. We'll just go ahead. I'll skip that one. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And in John, uh, when Jesus says that, he actually goes on. And not only is Jesus the light of the world, but in John 8, we go on and we read, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Jesus comes into the world as the light of the world, and he wants that light to enter in and to transform our lives. Not only is Jesus the light of the world, but according to the Gospel of Matthew, so are we. In Matthew, Jesus says, you, my followers, you are the light of the world. And he goes on and he says, let your light, just if we go to the next screen, yeah, people can follow. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I said earlier, I think God delights when we notice his creation. But even more than that, God delights, God smiles, God is filled with joy when we actually live in the way of Jesus and bring his light into places of darkness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that this morning as we come together as your church and worship, the Lord, you are here and you're present. And we are surrounded right now by your Holy Spirit. Just as the light that comes from the sun is all around us, it illuminates and it brings life, so is your Holy Spirit, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would be humbling us, that as Canadians, as we move into this summer, that we will all seek ways to bring about your light and your love and your hope into this place. May it begin by transforming us, O Lord, and that, Lord, you might move through our lives to transform this world. For we pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite Ava and Cassie to come, and they're going to be sharing with us some special music this morning.
Amen. We are here to pray with you, and we know that there are many people who are here, a part of this fellowship, who uh, are in need of prayer. And uh, after the service today, if you're here in the sanctuary, uh, two of our deacons will be just outside of this hallway. Uh, There's a prayer room, and if you'd like someone to pray with you, you're welcome to come to the front. I'll be here or at one of the side doors, and uh, deacons will have a prayer room open. And if you're online, and if you'd like someone to pray with you or to talk to someone, You can reach out through the Messenger on Facebook or YouTube, or you can call the church office, and any of our pastors would love an opportunity to meet with you. At this time, we, like those uh, disciples that night in the upper room, will draw to a close by singing a hymn. I invite you to stand together as we come to our last song to this morning. benediction, just a reminder that after the benediction, we invite you to uh, remain seated. The ushers will come from the back and dismiss you row by row as we go out keeping our two meters apart. Uh, And again, if you would like to stay afterwards for prayer, just remain seated. And after the people have gone from your row, you can come to the front or off to the side uh, to the prayer room and deacons are there looking to pray with you. Now may we go forth in the love of Jesus Christ and his grace For it is in his grace that we exist as sons and daughters of the beloved, a part of the family of God, called to live into this world and to be his light. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.